Yes, I know here you're in trouble. Gloria says about 30% are unemployed. That's why I'm working hard to get this surplus food here. Some of you say to me, well, I'm not like you. I'm not a congressman. Uh, I haven't got education. Uh, I haven't got work. Uh, uh, but you're a human being. And you know what you've got? You've got in your hand the power to use your vote and to use even those few cents you get from welfare to spend them only where you want to spend them. None of that. A young slave boy stood one day before the greatest ruler of his day. And God said to Moses, what's in your hand? And Moses said, Lord, only I've got a stick, that's all. He said, well, let me use what's in your hand. And God used that slave boy with a stick in his hand to divide the Red Seas, march through a wilderness, bring water out of rocks, manna from heaven, and bring his people to freedom land. What's in your hand? What's in your hand? George Washington Carver, who was so frail that he was traded for a broken down horse as a slave boy. And George Washington Carver, sitting in the science laboratory at Tuskegee, told me, he said, Dr. Powell, he said, I just go out on the fields each morning at 5 o'clock, and I'll let God guide me. And I bring back these little things and work them over my laboratory, and that man did more to revolutionize the agricultural science of peanuts and of cotton and sweet potato than any other human being in the field of agricultural science. What's in your hand? Just let God use you, that's all. What's in your hand? I've got a string in my hand, that's all, and I'm flying a kite. And way up in the heavens, lightning strikes it. And I, Benjamin Franklin, discover for the first time the possibilities of electricity with a string in my hand. What's in your hand? Little hunchback sitting in a Roman jail. I haven't got anything in my hand but an old quill pen, but... God says, write what I tell you to write. And Paul wrote, I have run my race with patience. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up to me a kind of What's in your hand, little boy? All I've got is a slingshot. And the enemies of my people are great and big and more numerous than we are. Well, little David, go down to the brook and pick out a few stones and come on back and close your eyes if you want to and pull back that slingshot and let him go. And David killed the biggest enemy, the leader of the giants against his people and his people became free, just letting God guide a stone in his hand. And a few years passed and David is a king and God says, what's in your hand? He said, I've got a harp in my hand. He said, well, David, play on your harp. And he played, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Taketh me to lie down in green pastures. Leadeth me beside still waters. Yea, though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death, I fear no evil. What's in your hand? What's in your hand? Man hanging on a cross. I've got two nails in my hand. Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdrawest thyself from me, whither shall I go? And that man, with two nails in his hand, split history and hair, B.C. and A.D. And what's in your hand tonight, people of Cambridge? You've got God in your hand, and he'll let you win, because he's on your side and one with God, always in the majority. So walk with him, and talk with him, and work with him, and stick together, and fight together, and with God's hand in your hand, the victory will be accomplished here sooner than you dreamed, sooner than you hoped, sooner than you prayed for, sooner than you imagined. Good night and God bless you.
wishing on a good phone. All you gotta do is just want it to be. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Rick Young, another segment of What's in Your Hand Radio. WXCR 90.3 FM, The Voice of Harlem. All right. Rocking with a little bit of Ozzy Brothers. That's right.
Oh, yes, indeed. We got work to do. We have a lot of work to do. Today, I want to, of course, you might have heard that uh, we want to make the sad announcement of the passing of Pamela Dixon. And her service is going to be on Friday. Uh, today, February 8th, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. at Mount Carmel Baptist Church. That is 348 Beach, 71st Street. And the, the, the internment is going to be at, it's going to be on Saturday, February 9th, at All Saints Cemetery in Great Neck, New York. So this is a very sad time for WACR when we lose one of our family members. She was a lover of WACR, attended all WACR events, and we're going to miss Pamela Dixon. And I want you to send out your prayers to the Dixon family, Tina Dixon, Pamela Dixon, her brothers and sisters, and all of her family during this very challenging time this is a time when we must come together we must come together during these difficult times and my name is Rick Young and this is What's In Your Hand at WHCR 90.3 FM The Voice of Harlem and as I'm going to move on as I know Pamela would want us to do. She would want us to be strong and continue our work that we're doing. And I know that that's what Tina's going to do and her family's going to do. They're going to be stronger than ever. And they're going to continue her legacy. Alyssa DeVere and my company is Ms. Informed. It starts with a book called Ms. Informed Wake Up Wisdom for Women and it has products as well as a speaking platform and I go out and I help women really gain confidence, get a lot more energy and overall just be a lot less stressed out. I decided to start Mint Green Marketing, which is a consulting firm, and that was one of the big reasons I really wanted to gain that creativity back in my life. Um, I really liked working with people and clients and all that good stuff that came with that consulting role. And as I was doing that to um, basically drum up business to find leads to network, I was doing a lot of presentations. 
uh, different elements in terms of marketing and getting out there and really talking to different audiences and found that I loved it. It was absolute passion, kind of being in that spotlight, being on the stage. There was something that went off in my head about two years ago and part of it was that I consult for a lot of women-owned businesses, medium sized, small, and there was this perpetual um, evidence, if you will, about a lack of confidence. They were very unsure, couldn't make a decision whether it was a logo or a color or whether to get money or grow things organically. That it was across the board, this kind of insecurity, nervousness, always asking other people's opinions, being very influenced by other people's opinions. So I decided to do a survey and went out and surveyed 195 women and asked them everything from their confidence, their childhood, their husbands, their partners, their marriages, their boyfriends, how often did they have sex, um, were they having sex with the people they were supposed to have, and you name it, we asked. Um, and subsequently had this wonderful database of information that then became misinformed. So I was able to take all that experience, as well as the passions about writing and presenting, and move it to the next level. And now that's what I do with misinformed. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is Rick Young, another segment of What's in Your Hand Radio, and I have on the line Alyssa DeVere. Good morning, Alyssa. How are you doing this morning? I'm great, Rick. How are you today? Preparing for the snow, I think. <laughs> uh, Well, you know, I, I, I meant to send you this in an email. I, I was a boxer. I know my listeners get tired of hearing about that, but I'm proud of that moment, and the name that I went by was The Quiet Storm. So oh, I, good. I have no problem with storms. Oh, they're good. You take them on, right? Right, ring, rink, or other, ring or otherwise. That's right. <laughs> and the it. DJ that just left, his name was Storm and Norman. He was asking me, "Was it snowing?" Yet I said, "What do you care about snow?" No, it's what, true. What it's do you true. care about snow? Your name is Storm and Norman. Oh, I so, love it. I love it. Anyway, so we just listened to uh, one of your uh, videos and. You you love to help women. Now let me the name of your company is called Misinformed. Well that's the name of my book, okay. uh, Misinformed Wake Up Wisdom for Women. And I still have a good hand in mint green marketing, which is really more the uh the, the marketing side of my life. Well, let me let me just ask you this, 'cause and and, and and all of my guests that I that deal with marketing I ask them the same question because Vince Lombardi was one of the greatest coaches ever. He would they would win a championship at the beginning of the year. He would say, gentlemen, this is a football. I mean, they didn't know what a football was, but he would, it was like he started from basic fundamentals. So to you, what is your definition of marketing? What is marketing? Well, that's a great, I love that analogy because I, I'm sure you've had guests and I'm sure you've read books and everybody defines it differently and it drives me a little bonkers. I'm sure it drives people who don't uh, really care as much about marketing bonkers. Um, marketing is very simple. It is the activities you do to make sales happen um, and happen quickly and as cost efficiently as you can. I would say to people, you know, go to New York, you can stand on the side of the street handing out you know, flyers and, and pay somebody to do that. It may not be the most cost effective way to do it and you may not be reaching the right people. So the marketing's sole purpose is to drive leads, is to help generate good leads for sales. But one of the things that you did, you did a survey of 195 women. So did you know that you wanted to work with women? Well, here's the funny thing, Rick, is that I, um, I, I'm naturally drawn to working with them, and I think they often need the most help, not just so much in their marketing world, but in their confidence. And so, you know, it's kind of a, a pleasure to be able to work directly with women entrepreneurs, women business owners, and so forth. Um, I will say, though, even the book and my blog and, um, and of course, all my marketing is still probably about 50, 60 percent men. Um, it's, there's no shyness here with uh, uh, people saying, look, I need some help and I want help from somebody who knows what they're doing. <laughs> so, um, or at least I like to believe that. So I, I, I can't say that I'm naturally drawn to working with women all the time. I just enjoy it. I think it's a really great opportunity to make sure these women, and they're really smart, they're talented, they work hard. Sometimes they just need uh, a good plug of confidence, and, and oftentimes the confidence is particularly in their marketing areas. Okay, so for some people this is a difficult time, and for some it's not. But let's look at it from a difficult standpoint, a challenging standpoint. I have this uh, challenge. The name of my program is called What's in Your Hand. 
What's in your hand means what can you do? And that, Alyssa, there's no one that comes to this planet that cannot do something. Something you can do, right? And I know you agree with that. So, I have this What's in Your Hand challenge. We put you, Alyssa DeVere, in a city where she knows no one. We're going to put $100 in your pocket and no lifeline. Say, hey, mom, pop, cousin, uncle, brother, sister, send me. Nope, you got to work it off of the resources of the city and your, your, your talents or your gifts. And you got 30, and you got 100 bucks, place to live, place to eat. What is Alyssa DeVere going to do in the middle of a big city, Chicago, Detroit, L.A., some, some city where you don't know anyone? What, what is Alyssa DeVere going to do? Wow, that's a good question, Eric. Holy cow. Um, I think the, the first thing, and, and you know, I, before you do anything, I'm going to use a, a sports analogy. I'm actually working on a new book, and we've been diving into how – really top athletes train as a, mm. as a study, right? Mm. And in okay. the good old days, I'm sure you will uh, and appreciate this and please uh, comment, the good old days, it was all about physical training, right? How strong, how fast, how, uh, how your endurance and so forth. And then people started realizing, you know, we really need to train athletes on the mental aspects of a game, you know, getting on the field, knowing your competitors, knowing you know, what your limitations were, uh, really understanding how you were going to tune out the crowd. You know, it was kind of a mental training, conditioning, if you will. And uh, there's a lot of books, you know, Agassiz and so forth, that really focus on what they did on the mental side. Great. Well, the top athletes now, Olympic and otherwise, they're starting to realize that that's not enough, and you need emotional training. And emotional training is the stuff that you bring into a room when you go to a meeting or you go into a new situation and you are able to put away all the distraction and all the self-doubt and all the things that would normally tap into your physical and emotional capabilities. And you remind yourself that I'm a really great marketer. I'm a really good person. I can do this. And that's the first thing I think you got to do. It doesn't matter if you have a dollar or a million in your pocket, is to remind yourself that you actually have the ability to do this. You've trained. You've prepared yourself mentally for it. Now let's go do it. And Part of that may be calling in the laws of attraction and other things. I, you know, we don't have to get into that today, but I think part of it is as a marketer, as a salesperson in particular, you need to have the wherewithal to be smart and figure out where those people are going to be that are going to want to buy what you have to offer and go to them. I think today we're so shy in so, so many ways. We like to send emails and email newsletters, and we leave voicemails, and we never actually get out there and talk to the, the horses, if you will. So putting on your kind of, you know, your good shoes and getting out there and, and talking to the right people. If, for example, you're marketing to, um, let's say, restaurants. Let's say that's a target. I was talking with a guy the other day. He builds mobile websites for a living. He was complaining to me that he's like, oh, I don't have any clients. I said, well, what kind of clients do you want to have? He goes, well, my stuff works really well with restaurants. I said, have you gotten out there and talked to restaurants? Well, I've been sending them emails. I'm like, when was the last time, you know, a restaurant guy had enough time to sit down and casually read their emails? It's not going to happen. Get out there. Talk to people. Find out where more of his friends, their friends, hang out. Is it an association? Is it a club? Is it a uh, particular um, um, it could be an online group, a LinkedIn group, or it could be some other place. But you don't know that until you start talking to the people who really are your targets. Wow. That's what I would do. Wow. So you got to talk to the people. You got to talk to the people. And I think most importantly, you know, it goes without saying whether you are down and out, you are in good shape, or you're in the city with 100 bucks in your pocket. Um, don't be afraid to get out and talk to people. And, you know, sometimes you have to do it on the phone. Okay. All right, but talk to them. Listen, ha you know, ask some questions. I, when you booked me for this interview, you didn't say, "Hey, Devere, you know, show up." You did your research. You learned about me, and and, and that's part of the marketing and marketing and sales. If I clump those together, um, those are really, I mean, that's the key. Know, know thy market. Well, speaking of uh, knowing about you, you have a book called No. Yeah, you have several books, but you have a book called No Time Marketing which is the, the subtitle of Small Business Size Steps in 30 Minutes or Less. 
Mm, pretty interesting. And then also misinformed. Can you tell us about those books? Sure, sure. Um, no Time Marketing is um, very straightforward because what I did a couple of years ago was package up what we normally do for a new client that comes to us and says, look, I don't even know what to do. I, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do with marketing. Either we've never tried it, we're scared to try it, or we did it and it's not working for us. And we said, well, what will we normally do? And we go through a series of steps. It's a, it's a very simple process. And the 30 minutes or less is if you grab your coffee in the morning and sit down and do one chapter, and it's a very skinny book, I think there's eight or nine chapters in total, by the end of the week, you're going to have your marketing plan built. So it kind of walks you through the very um, strategic, and I hate using that S word where people go, strategic, it freaks them out. But it asks them some very straightforward questions about their business, about their customers, what they know and don't know. And then it teaches where to get the additional information that you don't know without spending a ton of money or time, mind you, so that you really have a good basis of knowledge to make marketing decisions. And it, it gives you templates for all this. It gives you even a template for the, um, the plan at the end. And I've gotten into more um, fights. I could use you in my corner half, half the time with this, Rick, because people will say to me, oh, you've got to write a big, thick marketing plan. And I'm always like, no, you don't need to, and you shouldn't, and shame on you if you do. So um, I give a, almost um, a PowerPoint, a, a presentation template at the end because my fundamental belief is the more people you talk to about your marketing plan, the better the plan gets, the more confident you get, and then it will work. If you put it into a document, it sits on, you know, either on your hard drive or in somebody's desk drawer, and, and that's no use to anybody. So the book gets you all the way through those steps. And I think the reason that people really like it is it's not a heavy book. It's very straight up. It doesn't have a lot of fluff quick and easy read, gives you the templates, you get it done, you move on in your, your marketing. And um, more case studies, more, more people call me to tell me how well it's worked for them and the results in their business. So I feel pretty, pretty good knowing that it really is a good resource for people. Um, and that's no time marketing. Um, Ms. Informed, you know, you introduced me with the, the, the information on the background of the book. It really was a labor of love. This continues to be a labor of love just to help women. And, and again, a lot of men are buying the book and reading the blog, <laughs> um, which is wonderful. But it, it, it's, not, um, it's not really what I would call motivational or self-help. What it is is it's a very candid look at what is confidence and what do we do to either um, bolster it in ourselves and others or what do we do that's destructive. And women have these really, what I call in the book in particular, bonehead things that we do. We really sabotage ourselves a lot. We worry about a lot of things that, when you look at it from a big picture, you go, it's ridiculous. And men all the time, you know, why are you worrying about that? But we do. That's the way we're wired. So it kind of makes uh, light of the fact that it's very common bonehead behavior. And just knowing that is is kind of comforting. Um, And it it just kind of goes through what are the things that we can do to make ourselves feel better day to day. That's misinformed. All right. Now, how did you get on this journey of teaching, educating, and helping women and helping men as well. How did you get on this journey? Oh, goodness. How did I get on this journey? Um, Well, you know, I think everyone, with few exceptions, you you follow a career path. And, um, you know, for better or for worse, you may like it. You may be good at it. But I think in some cases you start to discover well after you graduate from college, if you do that path or well into your career, that there's things that you really love to do, things that you're really good at, and things that people appreciate that you do. And at that point, you know, 20, 30 years into your career, the big question of the day is, how do I make a living doing doing that good stuff, right? Um, I, you know, I suspect that you love doing this radio show. Um, anyone who gets up at 6.30 on a Friday morning to be on the show, you know, God bless you, well, man. I love it. Well, you say, um, you, say, and, you say get up at 6.30? I have well, to be here at 6. So. Basically, or you get up even earlier. I think it's, yeah. you know, it's a labor of love as well. And if you can find ways to financially support those, um, as people like to call them, hobbies. I, I don't think they're hobbies. I think <laughs> they're more than that. Um, and that's... So, you know, as I've been progressing, uh, as the video takes said, I, I really found this common issue that more and more people were coming to me for marketing consulting, but really asking for confidence consulting. You know, am I doing the right thing? Should I do this? What do you think about that? And, you know, in a marketing context, fine. But in a lot of ways, I was seeing it was permeating through their business lives, perhaps even through their personal lives, or mo- most likely through their personal lives. 
Um, and I decided to, you know, do a survey and get some, some data behind my assumptions there, and that's what I did. And combining that kind of interesting perspective, the data, um, with my love for, I do a tremendous number of presentations, and I love to present. It's just joyful to me. Um, and I love to write. So that's how I've kind of moved down the path. Mm. Now, let me get your website. Okay, well, I'm going to give you two websites. I'm going to give you one for the marketing and one for Ms. Informed. Ms. Informed is M-S, like uh, Ms. DeVere, Ms. Informed, I-N-F-O-R-M-E-D, so M-S-I-N-F-O-R-M-E-D, dot co. Um, dot, dot co? Dot co, leave off the M. Okay. Um, and uh, that's for Ms. Informed. That's information about the book, and the blog is there as well. Um, and No Time Marketing um, has its own website as well, which is the, not, is the book itself. So you can go notimemarketing.com, or if you want to learn more about uh, the marketing business that I run, it's mintgreenmarketing.com. Okay. Now, what is your USP, your unique selling proposition? Or the marketing specifically, you mean, or just in general? What is, what is it that Alyssa Devere brings to the table? Like, what is so? What is, like, why should I do business, or a woman, or anybody do business with Alyssa Alyssa Devere? What is your USP, unique selling proposition? My unique selling proposition. Well, I think first of all is that um, I will tell you like it is. <clears throat> I'm not going to uh, beat around bushes. I'm not going to. Um, you know, tell you that the baby is beautiful if the baby's ugly. And that Ooh. may be <laughs> unique or good or bad, but you know what? I'm all about um, getting to good. You know, I don't want to, um, if you have a website, for example, or your positioning and messaging is, is off, and it's off not because I think it's off, it's off because it's not working and it wasn't researched, I'm going to tell you, let's, let's, let's fix it. Um, and I think my clients really appreciate that because... If, um, if there's somebody who's going to hire me and wants my opinion but doesn't really want to hear the truth, then that, to me, is kind of a waste of their time and mine. Um, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to get you um, in a position where you can defend your decisions to anybody, especially yourself. And the only way to do that is to really look at things in an honest, truthful way. So I think that's the top of the pile. I think beyond that, you know, I, I know a lot of people. I know a lot of stuff about marketing because I love it. Um, and I think in some ways that, you know, it's a great opportunity for me to bring lots of different disciplines, <clears throat> you know, different industries that I work in. I, I, my clients, Rick, it's so much fun because they come from every country. I have a lot of international clients, about 50, 60 percent at, at any given time. So different languages, different products, different size companies. So I think it's a really good mix. Um, I, again, you know, some people want, I only want somebody who's marketed or knows about this particular industry or on this kind of person. Well, I think it's really kind of nice to be able to bring a lot more tools to the, uh, to the party. So I think I offer that as well. Alyssa, what is your definition of success? Um, loving what you got. Mm, okay. So I don't know if you, if this is important or not, but it, like, how do you encourage young young women to want to become entrepreneurs, or is that important to encourage them? You know, that's that's well put, Rick. I, I you know, you do hear so much about encouraging people to be entrepreneurs, and I've been having a lot of conversations lately. In fact, again, I don't know why. Um, I do a lot of work with um, centers for entrepreneurship. I speak all the time and present, and I was actually talking to yesterday a woman who runs a very large one here in the Massachusetts area, and I said to her, you know, I, I don't think of myself as an entrepreneur. I think of myself as entrepreneurial, and that's different. Um, I like to create. I like to um, um, see things through, um, but I'm not necessarily somebody who needs to have a big company with lots of people under me and stock options and that, and I think that there's a lot of people, particularly women, who fall into that category where they want to be creative and innovative and they want to be heard and respected and have the, those attributes of entrepreneurialness. Um, and you can get that. You don't necessarily have to run your own company. So you can do it in a big company. You can do it. Um, um, you know, I have friends who are personal trainers. You know, is that entrepreneurial? 
I think so. The way that they run their business, how they get clients, and they improve themselves and their wherewithal. I think that's all entrepreneurial. But it doesn't mean you have to start a business. Um, starting a business, is it good? For some, it's fantastic. For others, it's horrific. So I think you really need to know what your end game is, what you're trying to accomplish. And if you're trying to be entrepreneurial, maybe there's other ways to do it than just being an entrepreneur. Okay. And when is, what is one of the most creative marketing strategies you ever used for yourself or for a client? Oh, my goodness. I have um, – well, let me think for a second because there's a, quite a lot that um, I'm kind of um, you know, I'm very proud of. Um, the most creative, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. Um, most creative. And I think I'm hung up on that word, most creative, because there's so many different ways to define creativity, right? Um, most creative. Or let's say out of the box. Well, you know, I'll give you an example. This is a simple example, but it, it really works great. Is the book, No Time Marking, that we talked about before on the cover, there's a graphic, and it's got hundred dollar bills kind of in a in a um looks like a staircase kind of pattern like you're going up okay and you know it's a little trite if you think about it the picture itself but the reason i picked it it was a really kind of clever way to um to do it i have uh, i really one of my um inspiration is benjamin franklin so part of it was putting ben franklin on the cover of the book but then i took that i that picture and i actually made bookmarks that are those hundred dollar bills with my face in the space instead of Ben's, and on the other side is a promo for the book. Okay. And, you know, at first I was a little nervous. I was like, oh, you know, I wonder if it's legal. I went and talked to some banks, and they were like, oh, my God, we love these. So what's so <laughs> smart about it is that I'll take those with me, whether I'm going to a meeting or a conference, if I'm speaking at a conference, and I just leave them all over the place. And, of course, people think they're money. So they grab them, and inevitably they think, oh, it's really funny, it's really clever. And it's a little kitschy, I admit. It's probably one of the most um, you know, salesy kind of kitschy things I've ever done. But at the same time, people remember me, they get it, they think it's clever, they think it's fun, and most importantly, gets their attention. You know, I mean, in today's world, as you well know, I'm sure everybody on the phone knows, you know, it doesn't matter what you're trying to get somebody's attention on, it's hard. A lot of distractions. So you know, anything you can do to kind of make somebody – Pay attention and then smile. I'm all for it. And those bookmarks, very cheap to do. They work great. Well, maybe when they pick up those bookmarks, maybe it is money. That's the idea. <laughs> Hopefully. But you can't just cash it in at your favorite, you know, 7-Eleven. you got to actually do something to make it real money, I think. Right. I've tried, though. I, I have tried. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, this time went by so, so fast. So, so fast. I kind of knew it. But um, is there any final things that you want to share moving forward for the, you know, for the rest of the year as far as you know entrepreneurship, women, be it men or anybody that wants to be uh, an entrepreneur or entrepreneurial? Any, any ideas that you want to share moving forward into the, into this year of 2013? Well, I think you know, I think it's um, it's a great time um, to take the time. Uh, especially in the winter, things, I don't, it depends on where your collars are, but where I am, it's pretty cold. It's not like I want to go out spend a lot of time outside right now. And you're in the Boston area, right? Yeah, I'm in the Boston area, right. And so, you know, I say, you know, buckle down, think about what it is you really want to do. You know, not so much, I want to make a million dollars. That's not something you want to do. That's something you want to achieve in the end run, but fine. But what do you really want to do? What do you like to do? What are you good at doing? Um, and what is some, you know, envision yourself, okay, this is where I'm going to be, this is what I'm going to be doing, this is what my company, this is what my, you know, activity is going to look like, um, and, and have the confidence to know that you can do it. I mean, I think that we sabotage ourselves, the social media, the media in general, we're always finding reasons why we can, we don't, you know, that we shouldn't believe in ourselves and our capabilities, and you do, you have that physical training or that skills training, you probably even have the mental training, you really need that have that emotional conditioning now to, to, to make sure that you know that what you want is what you want and make sure that you are going to put a plan in place to get there. And in some ways, I, I fundamentally believe, Rick, that things happen organically thereafter. But if you sit and kind of mire in the fact that I don't know what I want to do, I'm not really sure, well, no, nothing's going to happen. So I think it's important to just put on, you know, put the plan in place and, and march forward and do your best to get there. 
Wow, thank you. Let me have your website one more time. All right, Mint Green Marketing for Marketing, MizInformed.co for the book, and NoTimeMarketing.com. You can buy it on Amazon as well if you'd like to look it up there. And uh, I really want to thank you for having me on this morning. It was a pleasure. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm playing a record called Summer Breeze, and uh, <laughs> maybe we need to think about Summer Breeze during this storm time. Oh, absolutely. Have Listen, a wonderful weekend. You have an extraordinary weekend, Alyssa. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Have an extraordinary day. Thanks. CR 90.3 FM New York I hope to be in love make me say it again girl make me say it again girl make me say it again girl
Yes, indeed. All I need right now is your prayers. Uh, I need your prayers. Uh, it's a very sad time at WATR. Tina Dixon, uh, her mother, has made a transition. It's a very, very sad time here at WATR. She was always here. She always supported the station. She came to all our events. And, and we're going to miss Pamela Dixon. And so I want you to say your prayers for Tina Dixon and her and her family. And um, wow, it's a tough time, I tell you. But in the meantime, I have a guest on the line and, and a very, very old friend of mine. Lisa, are you there? Uh, Lisa, are you there? Hi, here I am. There you are. Okay. All right. How's everything coming along? Very good. How are you? Now, you're an old friend of mine, but I, I always had trouble pronouncing your last name. How do you pronounce your last name? Skrilloff. Lisa Skrilloff. Skrilloff. That's Great. right. Great. Wonderful. Now, the name of your organization is Multicultural Marketing Resources. Yes. Tell me exactly what you do at Multicultural Multicultural Marketing Resources. This is a public relations and marketing firm. So we do a series of activities for businesses. Our clients are, are small businesses that want to get more business of their own. They're looking for more clients. And we uh, write press releases and send information about them. 
both to newspapers as well as to corporations. So we help make introductions for them to companies they might want to do business with. I'm a, I'm a writer at heart, and um, so I like to do things that um, write and position a client in the best possible light so the businesses that they're trying to reach will understand what they do and will want to do business with them. Mm. Now, some of the some of the organizations or some of the people that you work with, you work with African Americans? I do. Oh, my company, I named it Multicultural because everybody has something multicultural about their story. <laughs> Um, so it could be African American uh, business owner, Hispanic, Asian American, women as well, and also um, niche markets. Uh, I work with a lot of businesses that are um, certified by New York State as um, a woman-owned business or a minority-owned business. And uh, once they're certified, uh, I've gone to many sessions given by the state where they explain how to get certified, but they make the point, once you're certified, don't expect us to be, you know, ringing your doorbell. You need to be marketing yourself to us so we understand what you do. So in a lot of cases, I help these businesses to do that. Um, Another kind of uh, group that I work with are marketing experts in reaching African Americans. So... So an example would be um, a woman who's African-American as an an author of a book and also gives training seminars, and we help promote a company like that so that they get more companies that hire them. But also we work with ad agencies that produce the commercials that are geared toward African-American consumers and might run on, on TV or in general market publications or in black publications. Wow. And you're the founder and president. Yes, yes. I started the company almost 20 years ago. It's going to be our 20th anniversary next year. And um, I was interested in this topic. I guess I didn't even realize it was an industry. Um, But when I was growing up, my father's job had us moving a lot. We moved from New York to California. I also lived in Wisconsin, um, but he also had a job that took him to Germany, and we lived there for nine months, and in England for nine months, and I've also lived in um, Mexico and Spain. So while I was growing up, I had the experience of being an American girl living in a foreign country, and uh, it's kind of a what they might call the bicultural experience, where you're from one culture but part of another culture, you're part of two cultures, and it, I think it kind of uh, shapes your experience. So um, I started out as a bilingual uh, education, elementary education teacher. I had a double minor in Spanish and teaching. And my first job was teaching um, Hispanic kids in Wisconsin in kindergarten. And then I uh, lived in Madrid. And that's where I started working for a magazine. So when I came back to New York, I was interested in keeping all of these interests of mine together. And that's where I realized that there was this industry of marketing to Hispanics and to different ethnic groups. And I kind of uh, discovered that industry and and found my my niche of my own there. Hmm. Hmm. So now, this is very interesting, Lisa. I, I met you a long time ago. I'm, I don't remember exactly when. I went to one of your conferences. I, I was trying to remember also. I think it, it might have been um, at one of the business networking conferences that, that they have. There are so many of them, and they're such a good resource. And, and here's one reason. You get to meet a lot of people in your business and get to know what they do, and that's always so interesting, and, and stay in touch with them. Right, right. But here's the interesting part. You You started this business 20 years ago. Yes. Next year is going to be your 20 year anniversary. Yes. Right. Exactly. Went around with with, with your, the, So, do you know next year that the Super Bowl is coming to this area? <laughs> I did. I did hear that. Perfect timing. <laughs> I did, and in fact, um, interestingly enough, I got an email from the New York State, the Department Empire State Development. Now that I've been registered as a woman-owned business, I'm on their email list, and they send out announcements of, 
of bidding opportunities. And I just got one that said, um, come and learn how your you know, woman-owned business, how minority-owned businesses can get involved with the Super Bowl. And I was like, hmm, I wonder, mm. I wonder, wonder how I could fit in. Wow. So and your 20 year anniversary, this is perfect. It's perfect. Perfect. So uh, have you decided yet what you're going to do, or you don't want to let the secret out the bag? No, I, I don't know what the opportunities are yet. Oh, you mean from the anniversary? Oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't start thinking about that, but uh, I, for sure it would be something that would involve my clients as a way to also thank them. Um, recently I had a 15-year a anniversary with a client I've been working with for 15 years, and I was trying to think, you know, what should I do to, to thank them? And um, I discussed it with them. There's, you know, kind of two main um, presidents and vice vice president. And I said to the vice president, maybe why don't I take you and your family out for dinner? And and then, or maybe to the woman president, maybe we should go to a spa. And they said, you know what? What we'd like to do is is involve all our employees in the in the thank you. And they said, why don't you have a pizza party on a Friday afternoon? sponsored by your company so that all the employees could, you know, enjoy and, and you know, understand what the partnership has mean. And I was very touched, and I also was very glad that she, she called it a partnership, and she said, you know, what Multicultural Marketing Resources is, is, is a partner to us in helping us grow. You know, not just a vendor to the company, but a, a true partner. So I'm sure that what I, what I do might involve something like that. And it's... Um, it's hard to know, you know, when you're a small business and you start out very small like I did 20 years ago, what exactly is your anniversary date? You know, I do know the date that, you know, I, I kind of, um, you know, opened the checking account and the business name. That was, I didn't do that for a while because it took me a while to receive my first check. And then it was made out to Multicultural Marketing Resources. And then I realized, oh, I better open a, a checking account in that name. And I did. Um, and then there's also, you know, six months later, I incorporated the business. And so there's that date. But actually, I like to think of my anniversary as the last day of work at my old company, where I, you know, gathered up my shoes from under my desk and took all my personal things from the my desk and said goodbye to everyone. And, and that was May 20th. I do remember that day, and so so I kind of consider that my anniversary of my my new career. Okay, and that would be so. When it, that's going to be the twenty year anniversary? Yes, May twentieth of next year. That will be my twenty year anniversary. Okay, so you got to tie that into the Super Bowl. That's right. <laughs> that's right. It's a big event in New York. Now, now, what is your website? Multicultural dot com. Multicultural dot com. Yes. Okay. Now, you work with, let's see, let's look at some of the niches that you work with. You work with, let's talk about women, the women part, Mm because I just had a guest that was just talking about women. So talk about the women entrepreneurs that you work with and you help. Let's talk about them. Well, it's a a very important niche because um, luckily, I guess in this day and age, is a lot of um, companies are trying to figure out how to best market to women. So some of the women uh, entrepreneurs and companies I work with are experts in helping companies do a better job of selling their services and products to women. And also a lot of um, corporations are realizing that their women executives are not uh, advancing as much as the, the male executives. And they're wondering, why are they not retaining top executives? This is also true with minority executives. So a lot of women executives are now finding that they have an opportunity at companies to help them reach women, help them market to women, and help them do a better job of retaining their women employees. Wow. Okay. Wow. That's 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 pretty interesting because... As the young lady was saying that was on before you, she was saying that sometimes women have challenges with confidence and issues of just building themselves up. So uh, I can see what I could tie in. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why companies might realize let's help women with 
with training and provide coaching. Uh, it, is, it is true. A lot of women might have the, you know, fraud feeling that, you know, that they, that they think, oh, they're going to be discovered. They were hired to do something, but people will discover they're, they're not good enough. And uh, where they might find that their male count- counterpart doesn't lack that confidence. And I know that you work a lot in the area of uh, building com- confidence and helping um, people in their, um, in their career uh, achieve success through the activities you do that build confidence. And, and that's very important. You know what? To be honest, men have the same challenges as women. You know, maybe they cover it up good, but they have the same challenges as women. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But let's talk about the, you want to say something? Yeah, no, I was going to say, you know, people are people, and we all, um, you know, have the same things that go through in it, through our mind. Let's talk about that fifty plus group. What about what about those? What kind of work do you do with the fifty plus group? Well, um, the 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 fifty plus population is growing, and you know, the boomer, so called boomer population, uh, people who are in their fifties now, sixties. Um, you know, when you're, when you're young, you think, well, it doesn't, when you're in your 20s and looking ahead to people uh, uh, who, are, who are growing older, you kind of think, well, there's no difference between whether you're 50 or you're 80. It all seems old. But then when you get, start getting closer to, you know, 30, 40, and you're looking at 50, then you think 50 is not old. Right. <laughs> but, um, so... Companies at first were trying, you know, were kind of ignoring this demographic of the 50 plus. They might say they want to they want to reach consumers who are 18 to 49, and then there's the older demographic. But now, because so many people and a, a good majority of the population are going to be in that age group, and because of advances in medicine and and health, people are are fit and healthy at um, at that age. Even um, the organization AARP, which used to talk about, you know, which whose initials used to talk about, stand for retired people, uh, now people are not retired when they're 50. You know, people are working, not even mandatory retirement at 65. Healthy and, and active and consumers well into their 70s, 80s, and marketers are thinking, how do we tap this population? It's not just um, healthcare products that they're trying to sell, but they realize that this population, um, maybe they put their children through college, and now those children are on their own, and so they have more disposable income, and they're going to spend it on themselves. They're going to take maybe some vacations, whether it's a a small vacation or, you know, a U.S. vacation, or they're going to do that international trip they always dreamed about. Uh, And so marketers are realizing, let's tap this market. So believe me, marketers don't bother to spend money on trying to attract a target if they don't think they're going to get some business out of it. And so they realize that this is an important demographic that has money to spend, and they're, they're trying to figure out how can they best reach this market. And there are some agencies that have started that can help them understand how to um, do a commercial effectively to this to this age group. So it's a very um, growing growing consumer group as well. Right, because you could you see some people now and you would not think that they are fifty. You would not believe it. They look really good. Exactly, and I and I always like seeing those magazines that say, "Look who's 50," and then they show a picture of an actress or an actor, and <laughs> and you're like, "Oh my God, they look great! They look so great!" And then it gives everybody hope, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, what about that youth and teen demographic? I know you deal with them as well. Yes. Um, now, this group is also fits in with the multicultural part. Uh, I. I would say the word so-called minority because um, when you use the word minority, that means you know a small percent of the population. But actually, minorities are the um, majority, and there's a lot of studies, especially with the census, 
that show that the youth population is um, approaching 50% or more so-called minority, minority population. So that means that this, the um, ethnic population is going to be the majority, and this is the population of the future. So companies that want to figure out how to sell products and market to teens and youth, they need to understand that this is a, a multicultural population, um, sometimes straddling two generations as well. In some cases, if they're, um, you know, grandchildren of immigrants when it comes to the Hispanic market, they might be placed in the role of, you know, being a translator for their grandparents or taking their grandparents to the doctor if their grandparents don't speak English and they need someone to help. Um, but yet they're completely American and when it comes to the case of the Hispanic population. Same with Asian and also with African American. This this teen and youth population has, um, you know, is is marketed to by companies that want their business. That's right. That's right. So now let's look at the American Muslim population. I know you tap. Are you tap into that uh, demographic as well? Yes. There, there are some um, companies that are marketing to this group, such as um, Best Buy and uh, Western Union and Wilson Basketball as well. Um, and also insurance companies or car companies because this group has certain financial needs and car companies need to understand that if you're selling a car to someone who's American Muslim, then they're going to have certain needs when it comes to um, insurance or buying the car. Now, also, in some parts of the country, such as um, Dearborn, Michigan, where there's a large group of American Muslim consumers, then local retail stores like Best Buy will be particularly respectful and, and honor the holidays. And just like you might see um, in New York, Best Buy or any company having an ad, a circular saying Thanksgiving specials, in communities where it's heavily Muslim, then you'll see these uh, stores saying, you know, happy holidays to the various Muslim holidays uh, as well. So this is a, a, a group that in certain areas of the country, it, this population is a large and significant part of the population. Um, so that's the area that we get involved in as well, particularly with um, some clients that are agencies and have a particular expertise in marketing to this group. Now, this next group, they're like, what about this group, this next group I'm going to mention, because a lot of people seem to drop the ball on this group, and this is, I, I would say, a million-dollar group, and that would be the disability group and accessibility. Yes. You know, I have um, one company I work with that is an, uh, has, is an expert in helping companies market to the disability group, and there's a lot that that comes into play. When I've heard her talk at companies, um, I've heard her use the word kind of a open door admission because this is a group that, you know, anyone at any time could be disabled, any ethnicity, any group. And when we're talking about disability, it's not just a, a major disability, but it's also the, the disabilities that come with getting older as well. And so with an aging population, People are losing their hearing or their eyesight. And when it comes to marketing to this group, um, it, there are some you know, big ways and small ways. So, for example, if someone has a disability and they're going to want to travel, then they want to know um, that if they're going to a hotel, that the hotel room is completely um, accessible. Right, right. Uh, and companies need an um, expert to help them make sure that that what they have provided is accessible. I've heard about cases where someone might say, uh, "Oh well, well, in uh, we have a handicapped uh, bathroom, hotel room, 
but yet the door is too small for the wheelchair to get in. Wow, if you look could at get that. in, then the bathroom would be accessible. Right. But the door to the room is not. So some of the work they do is helping companies really make sure that if they're saying something is accessible, that it really is. And also, the things that have been done um, by the government to help people with disabilities have improved all of our lives. For example, um, those uh, when you're crossing the street, the what they call the curb cuts, where the curb slopes down so that a wheelchair can go down. Right, right. You know, anyone who anybody is is uh, uh, benefits from using that, not just a wheelchair, but it makes it easier to get down. Or if you are wheeling something yourself, then right, um, right. you know hey, that right. benefits us all. Right. Now, go ahead. You want to say something? And say? Um, you know, this is a, this is a huge market, and the numbers itself is even approaching the size of the, ba- the baby boomers themselves. So this is a, a kind of, a, could be, if a marketer is not paying attention, a hidden market, but a very important one. Right, because see, that's my point. I have a friend, Jackie Fernandez, who's blind. She's a good friend of mine. And a lot of, she wants to be an entrepreneur. And she's, no, she doesn't, she, she is an entrepreneur. But a lot of times she gets involved in businesses and the websites are not accessible. And the people that make the websites, they don't think about that when they're creating the website. So what do you say to that, Lisa? It's completely true. Um, and companies don't even realize because they're not even thinking of that. Right, so, that's right. So that's one thing that, you know, this uh, a marketing expert would would come and, and tell a company. So, you know, if somebody owns a hotel, then they're already thinking they need to make a room accessible. But if a company is not really thinking about people who are blind or otherwise disabled, it, this doesn't occur to them. So one thing that, you know, an expert could help with is to take a look and say, um, here's, here's some things you can do. And also, it goes a long way in saying, we want to do business with you. We're, we're, we're thinking about you. We want to do business with you. We're making it easy for you to find us and do business with us. And that's like a, an engraved invitation coming to your door. Well, you know what? We're talking about millions and millions of dollars because there are a lot of blind people in the world. Exactly. And this this disability is something that, you know, people are, um, even if they're not in a situation where they're blind, as people get older and they lose their eyesight somewhat and they need to wear glasses, and then they might realize, you know, without their glasses, they, everything looks completely blurry. So that's a disability as well. And uh, even things like um, having your website with really small type and it's really hard to read, I even find that, um, you know, if I get if I get something to read and it's really small, it, it's very difficult. And so it's important to make these not just accommodations but show the community that you want to do business with them. Right, that's right, that's right. Well, let me ask you, what has been some of your biggest challenges in running your business? Well, um, to be a business owner, you have to, um, you know, do a little bit of everything. You know, when you work for a company, the disadvantage is that, you know, your your time is not your own. You're kind of told what your hours are and you're told what's your next assignment. So the advantage of having your own company is you don't have someone saying, oh, that's not a good idea, we're not going to do that. You you can do that, but you also have to take care of all the things that, um, you know, otherwise would belong to a different boss. So, you know, I have, I rent an office, and so I have to take care of, of course, of all the, the bills that come with that, and, um, you know, there's a lot of forms you have to fill out, there's a lot of paperwork. And of course, um, you know, there's there's a, I also have elderly parents of my own, and so the the good thing actually of running my own business is is that if you know my parents need me, I'm able to say I need to leave for an hour and go help my parents and then come back to the office. That's why I'm very glad that they live kind of nearby. So, you know, being being a business owner, you have all of these, you know, 360 degrees of things that are going on. But you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tra- trade it for the world. Wow. Now you, you, you're in the New York area, right? Yes. Wow. Great. Now, 
is it is do you think it's better to niche market or is it better to say I want to I want to market to African Americans, I want to market to Hispanics, I want to market to Asians? Well, uh, I think it's good to have one niche market, um, and especially if uh, if someone's getting started, um, because when I say multicultural, it's not that. I do all of the things. It's like my clients, each of them do one thing. So if I say I'm able to offer multicultural marketing, what I'm really saying is which communities are you marketing to? Um, oh, Hispanic market, let me connect you with our Hispanic market expert. Perfect. Let me connect you with our African American market Perfect. expert. So the majority of the uh, companies, they do pick one niche market. That being said, there are a couple of companies that, within the same company, they do all the different ethnic markets, or they might do, you know, three or five specialties. And some corporations want to work with one, you know, very specialized expert. Lately, a few corporations have said, you know what, I don't want five different um, partners, five different agencies. I want one person who could do it all. So really, I think if someone were to pick... I think they should pick what they're interested in, what they're passionate about, what they have um, a good feeling about, and and something that an area where they feel that they can contribute, and that's what they should pick. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, you know, Lisa, these from what they say, these are some very challenging times right now. Yes. So, what would you what would you say to people that's want to become an entrepreneur right now like what how would you uh how would you uh consult them and they say hey you know what i want to be an entrepreneur i'm not sure what i want to do but i want to be an entrepreneur what would you say to them well i think i would ask them to think about what do they like to do you know is there some kind of uh, even a hobby or an interest they have and think is that something that could be a business uh, and also there are a lot of different, there's so many different networking events. If they're curious about something, you don't have to make a big commitment. You don't have to join an organization. You could go to one event and, and pay for one event and, and learn about an industry. Also, um, I also teach a class at NYU at the School of Continuing and Professional Studies. And um, wow. <laughs> you can you can take a class. Um, you know, my class is, is two days long only. So you don't have to make a commitment to like a year or a semester. I know a lot of my other, the other teachers in the department, they have a class that's just, you know, three, three weeks or, you know, and, it, and they're usually in the evening. So if somebody has a job during the day and they're, they're curious about something, they can explore that. And I see there's a, a lot going on in the digital area. One of my colleagues teaches a class in, you know, in in how to build a website or how to improve your own website or um, in social media. So something that someone's heard about and they're curious about, certainly there's a lot of um, uh, classes that you can take in the city. And not just NYU, but, of course, all the city colleges and um, almost every um, university or, or college in the New York area has a, a department where it's for continuing education, not just undergraduate or graduate students, and, and that's a good way. And not only that, but before you even sign up for a class, a lot of them have informational evenings that are free, and you can look in the catalog or online and find out, you know, when is that... Uh, I remember there was one for my department a Wednesday night from 6 to 8, and you could, you know, anyone interested could show up and hear short presentations by what goes on in the classes and meet the teachers. I love that. I love that. Discovering what's in your hand. I love that. So now, when you started your business 20 years ago, Lisa, was there a thing called social media? No. No, there wasn't. I didn't have, I didn't have a website. Uh, I, I didn't even have a fax machine right away, and uh, you know there was there was uh, there was email, but there was no social media. There and was email. <laughs> there was there was email, but now uh, of course I think a business realizes that they cannot do any business without having a presence on the web. There's an expectation of anyone. Any consumer who's interested in finding out about a business, they have an expectation that they could find them on the web. Even if they don't know their website address, 
that they should be able to Google and find the company, find their website quickly. So that means that for a business, it's very important to have a website and not only just have one, but to make sure that uh, you, you promote it enough so that companies can find you online and that when they go to your website, they get an idea of what you offer and that there's a lot of information for them and uh, that they can also get a sense of the business owner and a little bit about their style of doing business or the kind of business that they that they have and what w- and what would be the experience of doing business with them and it and also if it's a, a kind of website where you can order something you know whether ha- someone has like a jewelry line you know that the ordering process has to be very uncomplicated right we like uncomplicated we really like uncomplicated hold on a second lisa yes WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Rick Young, another segment of What's in Your Hand Radio at WHCR 90.3 FM, The Voice of Harlem. And on the line, I have the founder and president of multi- Multicultural Marketing Resources Incorporated, Lisa Squiroff. Did you. I say the name correctly? Yes, Squiroff. Thank you very much. Squiroff. Okay. And so now. What do you see down the road coming in the next 20 years? So we know there's what, how, how it has changed in the 20 years since you've been doing business. What do you see coming along in the next 20 years? Well, um, the, the business that I'm in that has to do with marketing to ethnic groups, um, it's, it's been a, kind of a, a slow a realization on the part of many companies for the past 20 years. Okay. You know, at first they weren't thinking about it, but now they're thinking about it. Many of them are doing it, you know, doing this and doing a good job, but some are just starting to think about it. But in the next 20 years, I think this is going to be not just a, a you know, a nice thing to do or, or a afterthought, but something that will be a very important part of companies' marketing. And already, you know, when companies are trying to figure out about marketing, they look at the census numbers. They look to see, you know, what is the community composition now? What is it expected to be? And the census already has has done projections that um, by the year 2050, the entire U.S., population will be a minority majority. So in 20 years, we're well on that road. And so I think they're going to be when it comes to marketing, um, you know, looking, looking at that, looking at that market. Well, listen to this. If, if President Obama did not look at that market, he would not be sitting in that seat right now. Exactly. You know, um, there've been a lot of articles I've seen lately on the power of the different um, ethnic markets to influence political outcomes. So, uh, and I saw a recent article, a, a, a writer was talking about that helps marketers realize if they see that uh, what is so-called buying power, uh, the electing power of minority groups, then they, they think, hey, you know, I'd like this group's business for my product as well. You know, it's all about selling and sales, and and entrepreneurs also want to do a good job of selling their business. Let me have your definition of marketing, Lisa. This would be a, a series of activities that lead toward getting visibility for your business so that you can get more clients and do more business. So what falls under marketing? That could be public relations, because you might be sending out news newsletters to companies to keep them remembering you. It could be um, doing presentations in front of groups. You could be nominating yourself for an award so that you, when you receive the award, companies, other companies will look and see that you have achieved success. And so all of these things fall in the area of marketing to grow and build your business. Mm. Wow, there you go. Now, speaking of uh, growing your business and marketing, tell me about some of the upcoming events that you have coming up. Well, um, in uh, April, there's a very interesting conference given by the Association of Hispanic Advertising Agencies 
and it's going to actually take place in Florida. And uh, there's going to be a series of speakers who are talking about um, how they, case studies of how they successfully um, grew their business in the Hispanic market. And I also, in New York, I belong to an organization, the Advertising Women of New York. And we're currently planning some events in New York that are going to be involving uh, women of color and um, focusing on some success stories and events where the attendees will have an opportunity to network th with them. And I also um, know that in the Asian market, the Asian Society has some events coming up. And I also belong to the Black Public Relations Society, Beepers, and they have regular events in New York on um, uh, where the members will hear from someone who who's, has an interesting public relations case study. So there's really so many things going uh -huh. on. You, could, you <laughs> couldn't attend an event every day after work and, and a breakfast event every morning as well. Wow, that's interesting. That's interesting. What I'm interested in, that, though, that sounds great. Those events sound great. But tell me about your journalist seeking experts query. Um, you know, I work, I used to work at the New York Times, and um, I was in the marketing department at the New York Times. Um, the publisher is very interested in diversity, and diversity at the New York Times means, um, usually diversity means helping employees succeed, attracting and retaining minority employees. But at the New York Times, I realized that what it also means is who, who stories get covered in a newspaper. And I was appointed to the diversity committee, and I heard, um, and that was really one of the first times I also was in the same room at a meeting with journalists, whereas I only had been thinking about marketing issues related to um, diversity. That's where I heard the journalists saying that, uh, first of all, the minority journalists were saying, we'd like to see the stories we write on page one. We'd like to you know, have more success in our stories. And other journalists were saying, uh, you know, we get criticized because we don't um, write an interview people of color and they're not in our sources, in our stories. They're not mentioned in our stories. Their stories are not covered. But we don't know about these stories. How could we find out about these stories? And so when, one thing that stuck in my mind about that was that journalists are looking for stories that they could cover that reflect the true diversity of New York City, a, a city that already is a minority-majority city. And so I decided to um, help journalists as well as help my clients to connect with each other. And so on our website, we have an area where if a journalist is working on a story, no matter what the story is, and they realize that, you know, a perfect example I always use is if, if a journalist is writing a story about the economy, and whether you're, you're watching a TV news segment and they're talking about the economy, or they're writing an article, then you might read it and say, gee, it looks like every person they quoted as an expert is a white man in his 60s. And how come these uh, um, sources are the only ones that are getting quoted? How come they're not interviewing me? And so I decided to let journalists know that if they're working on a story, if it's about an economy, let me help them get a wider range of experts that they could interview. So journalists contact us, and they say a story that they're working on, and I help them find an expert who happens to be a Hispanic or African American or Asian American or a woman so that these voices are heard in any story. And also, if, if they're working on a marketing story, they also call us. A perfect example is um, for the Super Bowl stories that were being written about the advertising, about the commercials, the Super Bowl commercials. Um, some uh, reporters from USA Today were working on a story, and they called us, and they said, you know, there are some commercials that we're wondering if one of your experts can tell us if it's if they're offensive to minorities. And I'm I'm talking about the um, Volkswagen one with the guy with the from Minnesota from the 
putting on a fake Jamaican accent. And so a reporter was doing a story and wanted to know, you know, is this is this um, offensive? Are people offended by this? And what do what do your experts? They asked us who do marketing to um, African Americans or Blacks, Caribbeans. What do they say about that? And so some people said that they were offended by it. It made for lively discussion. Later, you know, a few days later, it turned out that the Caribbean organizations were saying, you know, we love it. We're not offended. We think it's great. And even the uh, <laughs> tourism director of Jamaica said, hey, you know, we want to be in on this. You know, we want people, yes, we'd like to portray ourselves as being laid back. So come to Jamaica and see for yourself. And um, so in this case, that's how we connected the journalists who were working on a story. And they have an idea and they want to find um, an expert that they can talk to, and we connect them uh, uh, on the spot. You know, they might say they need someone to interview in the next hour, and so we help set up the interview for them. Wow! And uh, wow, you can you can do that in an hour? <laughs> yes, yes. We have a lot of people on on call, and so we can call, and we have many of them. So, you know, certainly we might call someone, and they. They're not in the office. They can't participate, or they say they, you know, are in a meeting and they can't do it. So we go down the line, and we find somebody who's available, and we set up the interview. And you know, the very same day, they're speaking to the reporter, and by you know six o'clock at the end of the day, the story is written, it's posted on the USA Today website, and it's in the paper the next day. Wow. Well, that's interesting. Let, let's say uh, I, you know, Lisa, I'm, I've been blessed. And I have a lot of guests on top of guests on top of guests. It's almost like a, a apple tree. I could pick, you know, my guests. I have so many guests, right? Yes. But what happens if it's uh, Thursday evening and I'm coming from work because I do teach boxing too. So that's why I, I got back to you so late last night. I was I have a busy day on. Uh, I teach early in the morning. I teach in the evening. That's why I didn't get back to you so was so late. So let's say it's a Thursday evening or or Saturday evening and it's like getting close to say midnight and I need a guest for six o'clock in the morning. Hmm. Can I call Lisa Squirrel off and say Squirrel off and say, Hey, <laughs> Lisa, I need a guest. I need a guest for Friday morning. Or I need a guest for Sunday morning. Uh, on uh, a specific topic. Can can we make that happen? You know, I do work with a lot of people at the last minute, and in in the radio business, that's you know that's something that could happen. So if if there's an emergency, I'm always happy to help out in an emergency. But I know that uh, when it comes to radio, it's always good to have like a backup guest, a perennial backup guest. So if you have one guest who, you know, all of a sudden at the last minute can't be on the show, it's definitely good to have somebody. And yes, we could <laughs> we could you know help you with that. And I know from from you know radio of course you you need to have a fill in guest so i i think you know it's good to be prepared and the same thing whether it's radio tv this this is something that happens and also when news breaks you might not realize that there that you need a certain guest with an expertise and you need to find that guest on the spot i'll i'll relate that to kind of a funny um connection I have, which is that I also do public relations for my dentist. So, ah. because uh, I've been going to the dentist and, you know, and he knows what I do and he started, you know, talking about his business and, um, and so then I thought, well, you know, sometimes a reporter, there might be some reason why a reporter needs to interview a dentist. And so I was able to connect my dentist uh, with the last minute um, and he appeared in the Daily News. So yes, uh, when news happens, you need to be there. Wow, that's right. Wow, Lisa. Well, we're almost at the end. Any any final thoughts that you want to share? Uh, any final thoughts that you want to share about you know your business, multi multicultural marketing resources, ain't? Well, um, you know, I could. Yes, I'd like to kind of you know tie it in with your kind of genre, the mo motivational talk. 
And, um, you know, I think that having your own business is very motivating. And it's, it's not that someone has to be motivated to get their own business. If, you're, if you already are motivated, then I think having your own business continues to motivate you. And, and I'm sure you know everyone's heard the expression that, you know, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And so you're working extremely hard. You know, you're working, like you say, till midnight, till 1 in the morning. But it's something that motivates you and thrills you. And so that's the one thing that I'd want to communicate about the company and also about having your own business is it's, you know, something that, that brings, you know, happiness to your life. Wow. Wow. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Lisa, I want you to keep us abreast of some of the upcoming things that you have coming up. Keep us uh, informed. You have a home here now. That, uh, um, and if you want to get anything across on the radio to a, a specific market or niche. Thank you. I'm here. Thank you so much. Because, you know, we go way, way back. We don't say how far back, but we go <laughs> way back. That's true. That's true. And I'm very happy to know about your success as well on the radio and and with the boxing, it's it's a, a great combination. Great. Co- oh wow. Uh, is that was that a pun intended? Great combination. Oh, is that a boxing term? Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, I guess I picked it up. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, thank you, Lisa. Um, wow, you have a fantastic. Well, you know we got the storm coming. So are you ready for the storm? I have to go buy groceries right now. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, let me let you go because mm-hmm. those those supermarkets are going to be packed. <laughs> Well, thank you. You have a wonderful day, too. All right. Thank you. All right. You have a great Thank you again. Thanks. Bye. All right. That was Lisa Squirloff. And, wow, Shane, listen, you want to start a business? It's out there for you. People like Lisa and people like Alyssa can help you with your business. So we have a few minutes left, and I'm waiting for my next DJ to come in, and he'll be here shortly, but I want to dedicate the last few minutes of this show to the the lovely Pamela Dixon, who made a transition, and we're going to miss her. We're really going to miss her. So, again, her services are are going to be this evening from, the viewing is going to be from 5 to 7 at Mount Carmel, uh, Mount Carmel Baptist Church. That's 348 Beach, 71st Street. That's in uh, Rock. That's in Rockaway. Our 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 on view on view New York. Excuse me. And they're gonna have the. I don't like the word funeral. They're gonna have the service tonight at 7 p.m. And the internment is gonna be at All Saints, that's going to be February 9th, or that's Saturday. Wow, this is a tough one, ladies and gentlemen. Tina Dixon is such a great person, great human being here at WACR, and she's the, she's the glue that keeps us all together. And we're going to miss her mom. So I'm going to dedicate this song to you, Tina, and your mom, Pamela Dixon, and your family. I'll see you guys on Sunday. Weeks.
Stay. 